My name is Nairi Woods and I'm Dean of the Blavatnik School and welcome to those of you who are visiting us for this session on creating Wakanda, youth technology and entrepreneurship across Africa. Uh, we're delighted to be hosting this discussion today, which is part of a, an enterprise the school has engaged in and which Strive Maziwa is one of the leaders of called Pathways to Prosperity. And the question that that two-year project, it's not a standard commission, it's more a, a global conversation and some global direction finding, which is asking, what are the new pathways to prosperity that technology is affording for countries? So we all have some quite set ideas about what it takes for a country to increase its prosperity and to increase the well-being and welfare of its citizens, but many would say that technology breaks through that and opens up whole new pathways. And our job is to consider what are those pathways and what are some do's and don'ts for countries, for entrepreneurs, for students, um, as, they, as they try to ensure that their country gets on one of those pathways. And that's what we're, we're here to discuss today. So sitting on my left is Strive Maziwa. He needs little um, uh, introduction since um, you're here in large part because Strive is here. And Strive, it's such a pleasure to welcome you back to the Blavatnik School of Government after some time. Strive was the founder of Econet and now the chair of the Econet Group. He's very much one of the continent's thought leaders and also a truly inspiring philanthropist and supporter of talent. There's some 100,000 young Africans that Strive and his wife and family have supported through different parts of their education. An extraordinary, they've played an extraordinary role. And then many of you will know Strive from Facebook, where he has one of the most visited Facebook pages um, in the world. I'm going to, we're, we're also joined today by two entrepreneurs from the continent. So Jessica Price, on my left, who grew up in Johannesburg and is the co-founder, is the co-founding partner of the Rhodes Incubator, based here in Oxford. And here on my right, Atherton Mutombwera, from Zim, originally from Zimbabwe, um, and the founder of Hutano Diagnostics, um, a fabulous startup looking at diagnostics of infectious disease in Africa, and I think at the moment looking at Ebola and diagnostics for Ebola. So um, terrific to, to have all three of you here. Strive, you're the one that's created your own pathway using technology. Um, what would you say to the big question? What to you are the most promising pathways that technology, does it open up a new pathway to prosperity? I, I think that, um, well, first of all, it's great to be here. Um, it's, it's been a long, you know, last time I was here, you were in a little corner somewhere trying to persuade me to send some of our students here. Mm -hmm. It's amazing what you have done here. Wow. And anyway, it's great to be at Oxford. You know, I only, I'm still looking for some kind of diploma out of Oxford. You know, I never <laughs> cut, I never cut the grade, you know. Now I'm sitting next to Jessica, and, then, and this is great. Uh, really smart, smart young people. But anyway, in answer to, to your question, first of all, I was misled by, in coming here because they told me it was about Wakanda. <laughs> you know, in my household, there are five girls. They're all from Wakanda now, you know. They're really, you know, very uh, energized and confident. We should make more of those kind of movies, don't you think? So anyhow... Look, to this serious question, look, the, the issue of technology creating pathways to prosperity is not an issue for debate. It, it's, it's, it's a historical context. We cannot uh, have a debate about that. Uh, technology invariably opens new pathways to prosperity. The, the, there are two things that are different now. It is fundamentally the pace at which new technologies are coming through and the profound nature of some of those technological changes. 
what we are facing with artificial intelligence or biotechnology is so extraordinary that it, it, it cuts to the very core that if we do not if we do not handle it properly, it is, as, it is as fundamental and profound as nuclear energy mishandled to the future of humanity. Okay, that's the difference. The, the difference is the pace at which we are facing changes. In the past, a technological change would come along. Let's take the car. Imagine there were conversations in America, what's gonna to happen to all the guys who who look after horses and who look after carriages, you know, and people screamed and shouted about uh, uh, the environment and other things that would have emerged at the time. But the transition into, into the technology, the time for people to adjust and change with that technology was a lot longer. You could, you could if somebody discovered uh, Xerox, you could create a whole city before and have a prosperity out of it for 50 years before somebody else copied you. Not anymore. Everything happens at a much quicker pace. Adaptations and people copying you by the time, because you're all sitting here, an idea might start here, but it's going to be exploited in China or Nigeria. You know, it's the universality of that is new. So this creates, in a human social context, some new challenges for us. So even as we create, even as the case for uh, prosperity is a given, the case for inclusion is not given. The case for major dislocations, both social and otherwise, becomes even more difficult to handle. So we may face extraordinary disruptions uh, as, as a consequence of it. So I'll stop there for a moment. So the speed of change, you've said, is the really different thing. Is that to countries across the continent's advantage or disadvantage? <clears throat> the, 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 the change itself is, in a sense, amoral. In, in, it's, it's, it's about how humanity responds. Okay? Some will f feel threatened and respond in a, in a threatened way, and some will see opportunity. It's about positioning people to see opportunity. That is, it's because we're not going to be able to protect people from change but we can make them much more resilient in the way they respond to the changes as they go. So we are having to train people uh, in, in, in ways we've never had to train people before. And in what ways? So if we're thinking about people on the continent, do you mean teach them to code before they're five or, or what? what? Though, absolutely, Though, those are just some of the things we're gonna have to do. We're going to have to, for instance, in Africa, and anywhere in the world, I might say, totally upend our education system. It's absolutely not fit for purpose. It will not produce the people that can respond and operate within that environment. Now, to what extent are we willing to embrace the change? The way we approach uh, education in science and maths, Africa is way behind. Okay, uh, and we have to pick up the challenge of how China and India, other developing parts of the world, are responding. Uh, what constitutes labor in the future is itself going to be profoundly questioned. So it's not enough to say we have a billion people. We may have a billion people that can't work because of the, because of the nature of the technology that we then face. Uh, so we, that means we have to begin to become a little uncomfortable. Just before I open up for questions to you and then come to Atherton and Jessica, I guess three decades ago, mm -hmm. you were at the front of the wave 
on change when you created EcoNet in Zimbabwe. So for those in the room who are perhaps in their career where you were 30 years ago, what's, what lessons would you impart? So if you wanted picking, picking up a technology, running at the front of the curve with it, what did you learn? Are there any do's and don'ts? Yeah, don't, don't take dictators to court. <laughs> okay, <that's> lesson <laughs> one for today. One. Do not take dictators to court. I thought you won. I did, but I haven't been there for 18 years, okay. Naira. You know, I mean, <laughs> you, you know, so you, you, you win some battles. Uh, there are different ways of doing things. Uh, but I did, I did take the government of Zimbabwe to court mm -hmm. and fought a legal battle for five years. And won, and uh, we established um, a very successful telecommunications business there. Then I kind of picked up my bags and moved to South Africa and began to build businesses in other parts of mm -hmm. the continent. Uh, I, I think some of the, 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 one of the key pathways, and we're coming back to the, to the work of the commission, entrepreneurship, both in terms of the way people approach problems. So don't look at entrepreneurship in a mechanical sense. Entrepreneurship is not about making money. It's a, it's a way of thinking towards solving problems, whether it's in social impact or for profit ventures or sustainability. So we need an entrepreneurial mindset now. Because we, you know, we look at our universities. <clears throat> we are producing graduates, but they don't have jobs. And yet, if you got one of those graduates and said, sit down, can you draw me a business plan? The universities didn't train them that. They didn't train them how to set up, run a business in the laws of their own country. They can't even register for tax. They don't know the labor laws because they were trained to go out and work for somebody. They were not trained in the mindset that says, you are the guy who's going to create the job. OK, so I, I was recently in Israel looking at the whole startup nation philosophy, because the philosophy in Israel. And I was fascinated. High school students setting up companies in school hiring their colleagues. By the time they're leaving high school, excuse me, they know exactly how to set up a company under Israeli law. Why shouldn't that happen in Nigeria? But you get entrepreneurs in Africa who have been at it for 10 years and they still haven't been persuaded they should be paying tax. <laughs> so how do we run companies, the countries? So uh, there, there is entrepreneurship is an established pathway in Africa. It's not new. Africa survives on entrepreneurship. But it's about how do we recognize it, nurture it, and take it to the next level that will produce the enterprises that enable us to compete. We don't want to be the consumers of Google and Alibaba and Apple and Facebook. We want our own. That's not to say we don't want those to be there. But we want a generation of entrepreneurs, particularly at the elite level like you guys, to leave this kind of place saying, if Mark could do it, I can and should be able to do it. And, and that is one of the pathways that we need to open up. So we're a school of government. We're about entrepreneurship in the public space. Uh, teaching people and helping people to be problem solving in government and to take responsibility for solving problems in government. And what, what would your priorities there be? Um, we need to take arrogance out of African governance where you don't listen to the ideas of the people that you're governing over. Okay? We, we, we need to listen. We can't suddenly produce laws that no, when no one was ever consulted. Uh, we, we have to approach things very differently now. 
uh, when we talk of investment, it does not mean foreign investment. Your own people are investing. How do you harness the, the solution capabilities within your own societies and communities? So the, if, if you can, as the new leadership, begin to a, recognize the role that entrepreneurship can have in your communities and how it can be nurtured, whether they be market women who, who can't read and write, but you know what, they can count money and get you to school at Oxford, correct? <laughs> so we have to respect them and find solutions to develop their, their, their enterprises and work with them. Mm -hmm. Great. Any questions specifically to Strive? Yes. And do introduce yourselves as you ask your questions. My name is Tony Lajwoli. I'm the managing director of Winnow Solar Nigeria Limited. We provide solar systems to micro and small businesses. So first of all, I want to personally apologize for what you went through in Nigeria. And I want to thank you for opening the door for people like me in terms of what you created. You literally started the mobile revolution in Nigeria. And on the topic of taking on dictators, one challenge that we're facing in Nigeria is that regulations are basically bottlenecks. For example, mobile money hasn't penetrated Nigeria because of the regulation that is stopping us. How does one that has the right intention to use technology to transform Africa carry out that good intention with, uh, by, by circumventing the regulations? And there was another question yeah, just in front of you. Hi, uh, my name is Ngoni Mugwisi. I want to thank you for two things. Uh, first of all, the work you do in education. I am a Joshua Light, and uh, I wouldn't be here without the Joshua Nkomo Scholarship here in Zimbabwe. Secondly, um, I want to thank you for, 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 for this uh, discussion. I'd like to know what you think the real world vibranium is in Africa, since we are talking about Wakanda. Uh -huh. we, we, we have a lot of resources in Africa, but... Uh, a lot of them remain untapped. Uh, what do you think uh, is the equivalent of vibranium? Thank you. Can I start with his yeah. question yeah. first? <laughs> if you brought me a Nigerian oil block today, okay, or a Botswana diamond, uh, what, did, what, what diamonds are found in, what do they call them? You are South African. <laughs> where, where they find diamonds, diamond and gold. I won't invest in them. And the reason I chose I will not invest in resources is because I want to move us away from seeing resources as the key to our prosperity. Okay. America produces more oil today than most people, but nobody thinks of America as producing oil or being dependent on oil, okay? Uh, we cannot produce such smart guys like you, and then all we think about is how do we dig a hole in the ground to produce something, okay? Now, don't misunderstand me. It doesn't mean we shouldn't have oil and platinum and so forth, but I, I hate this idea in our schools where we say, we are rich because we have platinum, we have gold, we have oil. I want you to say, we are rich because we are smart people. That will find solutions and create enterprises of the future. Okay? That includes using our resources to produce products ourselves. Okay? And innovating around our resources. So, so yes, that mythical idea is great. Uh, but I want us to move away from that, that there is, we're all just waiting to strike oil and then we're off. Or we're, gonna, we're waiting to find diamonds and then we're off. No. That's, that's not the way we're going to have to build our future. That was for a different generation. Now, coming to my friend from Nigeria, nothing bad happened to me in Nigeria, let me tell you. Some bad things happened to people who came to fight me. They ended up in jail because I, I went after the governor who was involved in corruption and he served 13 years. He was sentenced to 13 years in this country for asking me for a bribe. Okay, so I fought back against corruption and I'll always do that. 
But um, the Nigeria is a country that has extraordinary potential for Africa. You know, by the turn of this century, there could be a billion Nigerians. So you better get used to having Nigerians here. <laughs> okay? So they are, they are the, they are the absolute heart. If Nigeria works and works well, the continent is in great shape. Uh, but there are always going to be extraordinary challenges in a country that, that big in, that is developing. But its entrepreneurship is alive and well. Again, what Nigeria needs to do is to move away from this mindset of oil. Okay. For example, Nigeria's uh, film industry, Nollywood, employs far more people than the oil industry. You know that. But whoever thinks about that? No, there are no policies to support it. Uh, this movie should have been made in Nigeria. <laughs> and certainly they have the skills to have done 10 Wakandas. OK, and certainly at half the budget. <laughs> in Nigeria, they make a movie for $10,000. Amazing. So, you know, that's, that's uh, where I'll stop there on Nigeria. Fantastic. Well, I think the, your answer to the first question about uh, the continent's real magic ingredient is sitting in this room. Yeah. Um, and there's many of you, but there's two in particular who are sitting near me. <laughs> and so let me, let me move to each of you. So, Atherton, you know, you've founded Hutano Diagnostics. Um, say a word about what your startup does, um, and then and then we can and then the audience can ask you more about it. But first, tell us about Hutano Diagnostics and setting it up. Thank you so much. So there are seven diseases that are infectious and recurring on the African continent, and these are called emerging and dangerous pathogens. Now these are Ebola, Lassa fever, dengue, CCHF, Marburg virus, Rift Valley fever, and Lujo. Now. It's important for us to be able to identify, isolate, and manage a patient who presents with one of these diseases. And to be able to do that, we currently take blood from a patient who we suspect have one of these diseases. And then we send that blood to a lab. And there are only 14 labs on the African continent that are capable of diagnosing if someone has one of these diseases. Now, the challenge is that these diseases present with very common symptoms, fever, headache, muscle ache. Now, there are about a billion people, billion cases of fever, headache, and muscle ache every year on the African continent. And of these cases, any one of those could be one of these diseases that are important to us. And so what we are doing as Huchano is to simplify disease diagnostics. In that, what we are saying is, let's meet a patient, prick their finger, put blood on the diagnostic test, and then we're able to diagnose them within 10 minutes. Once we know their diagnosis, the device sends a message to an online database. And then it says, the GPS location for a patient who's been diagnosed with this disease is so, and the disease that they have is this. Once we have that information, we can track the disease, as well as identify where it's going to go next, predict the spread of the disease. Now, what we're trying to do is to simplify access to healthcare, particularly the diagnostics of emerging and dangerous pathogens. So that's what Utano is doing. And how far on that pathway are you? I mean, do you already have the kit? So that's, that's, an, that's, that's an exciting question. So I started working on this in 2014 mm -hmm. as a master's research project in South Africa. Mm -hmm. So I worked on the biotech and the nanotech behind the technology. Mm -hmm. But then the question is, having the product doesn't mean you've got the business. And that's, what, that's how I find myself in Oxford. Mm -hmm. I did the MBA to be able to build the business with the assistance of the people that have really been helping us along the way. So the question around where are we, I'll sum up and say we've been doing three things. The first thing is the pipeline to product development. Mm -hmm. How do you develop such a product? The tech, who do you work with? Who are the people that you need help from? What is the equipment that you need? The second thing we've been doing has been around understanding what the needs of the people that are on the ground that engage with these diseases are, be they conversations with people at MSF or conversations with people at Public Health England or people in Sierra Leone uh, who recently had the, the Ebola outbreak in 2014, and understand what they need and what's important to them. Mm -hmm. And the last part has been trying to build a business around this. Mm -hmm. 
Because now when you look at it, let's just put it as uh, 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 someone who's helping me understand business and say there are three things you want to understand. You want to understand the idea and the people. Mm -hmm. right? What's the idea you want to do? Who do you need to do it? Mm -hmm. The second thing that you need to understand is execution. What does day-to-day -day operation look like? Uh, what does what morning to evening look like? And the last thing you have to do is the company structure. Mm -hmm. How is your company structured? What amount of tax are you paying? And what tax uh, benefits are you going to be getting from the way you structure the work you do? So those are the three things we've been doing with Hotano. And is your company going to be a British company? So Hotano Diagnostics is registered in the UK. Yeah. Yes. And that's because? Ah, so we've broken Hotano into two bits. The first bit is the product development phase. We need to build the diagnostics that we are talking about. The second phase is the manufacturing and the distribution of the diagnostics we're doing. Now, there are a couple of parameters that are important to us in this first phase of building the products that Rutan is going to be making. And the, that is the tech. What does your tech do? How far can you push it? And who do you need to help you to push it? The second is the people that will help you to do this. The third is the timing in two different spaces. The first space is the biotech space where the technology is rooted and we are about to take off. And the second is timing in terms of disease outbreak preparedness, and we're seeing a lot of growth in this industry. So to be able to tap into the different people who are active in these fields is something that's really beneficial. So to answer your question why we're set up in, 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 in the Oxford. UK, right, in Oxford right now, is because Oxford allows us to be able to get access to the technology as well as to the people that are working in this space and the people that have worked on disease outbreaks, such as Ebola. So that is one of the reasons. But the answer to that is also that we have not yet registered on the African continent. Mm -hmm. Because once we have developed our prototype mm -hmm. and we've got it FDA approved, mm -hmm. we are going to start product manufacturing and distribution from the African continent because mm -hmm. there are lessons we need to learn. Mm -hmm. How do you distribute a product? Mm -hmm. Which is something I find really exciting because someone is able to deliver a loaf of bread to a remote place. What are the lessons they've learned? How do they do that? What can we learn from them? So yes, we will register our diagnostics on the African continent because that's where we want to manufacture and distribute our products. Fantastic. Any any questions for Atherton? Yes, right here. Hi, Atherton, I'm Kaze, and um, I'm originally from the DRC, uh, but I work in Berlin, Germany, um, doing recruitment for engineers and data scientists. And re I was really happy to see what you're doing. And one of the things I would like to know from you or to recommend is to is to find out if you've had, if you have a community of people around you who are helping you push this idea. And one of the things that You're I not see. Poach them from him, I <laughs> <laughs> no, no, maybe I'll poach him. <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to clear that. And what I've seen really in Berlin is really this community support that ideas or innovators have from people around them. And from there, once you have your product, you're surrounded by people who love just love what you do and are interested in seeing your product being developed and being shipped. From there, you sort of like get, you know, um, you, move, you move step by step. And I wonder if you have that kind of support or how would you organize for us in this room in the UK or even in Africa, which will be even better because that's where your market will be. How do you get people to surround you and help you launch your product to the market? Question. Was there another question for Atherton right away? Yep. Hi. Uh, my name is Kwelumi. I'm an M MPP student here. And unfortunately for you, Atherton, you need a lot more to convince me, considering the whole issue with the runners. Joke. Yes. Theranos. <laughs> yes, Theranos is the company that set up fingerprint and testing. Homes. And so we find that a lot of you tech people come and say a lot of big words and you know, nobody wants to admit that they don't know. But that's by the wayside. How do you work with African countries, African governments, and you do it transparently, so no corruption, no bribery, no getting someone to push your document? I, at some point, I, had, I was able to work with Ashifi Gogo, and um, so they had this thing where you scratch the technology, so you scratch to verify the authenticity of your drug, yes. So I worked with that person, but it's been very difficult because you have to go from 
So that's about 54 or so different regulatory regimes, and we all know how things are, so that's one. Okay, so two challenges from Palumi there. One is a question you probably get all the time, given you the fingerprint, which is, are you another Theranos? <laughs> Complimentary. Um, so that's question one. Um, and, and question two is, how are you going to work with corrupt governments or difficult governments to work with? Mm -hmm. So, and then we've got the question about a support network. So do you want to reply to any of them? Then we'll, we'll ask Strive how he would answer these questions for you. So. I think that's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> I'll make it very difficult for him. So uh, the question around getting to work with other people is quite an exciting one. So the one thing that I've learned from when I was doing the MBA that I was doing and now, which is about 10 months afterwards, has been to speak to people about what we're doing. So to me, it's important that we have a conversation. And early on, it was exciting if you would tell me that you think what I'm doing is really great. But as time has gone on, it's really important to me that we present the business idea and then we poke holes into it together. Where are the potential weaknesses and how can we build a better business around that? So let's, test, let's determine the structure and let's see what I'm not seeing, what we are not seeing as a team before you go there. And the importance of these conversations is that the more the people I speak to, the more I see people who tell me, hey, you know what, the idea that you're talking about is exciting. Yes, some time back I got an exciting about doing the same thing, but say with vaccines or with drugs. And that was a conversation with a professor of virology here at Oxford. And he's been really helping us as our technical advisor in terms of thinking about the technology and what we want to do with it. He's also been helpful in terms of identifying and introducing us to people that are helpful for the product we're developing. So in that particular conversation I'm describing, he said, you know, I know the first person that wrote the journal, the first journal article on the technology you're using. I'll introduce you to them. That's fantastic. So that's one of the ways in that speaking to people has helped us to be able to build a team of people who helps us. And the exciting, another exciting thing is when, you, when I speak to people and identify people who see the vision of where we want to go and who are honest when we have the conversation to say, we think you're strong here, we think you're weak there, it helps us to think of different models. Another example is a conversation with someone who's in uh, film. They make movies, they produce movies. And how they produce, distribute movies is that, so if I've made a movie, I need money to make it. So I get the money from a big, big organization. Once I've made the movie, I give the movie to that organization and they distribute it. And that's how they make their profit. That conversation is important to me because one of the questions in diagnostics is who pays? Fantastic, you've got an exciting diagnostic, but who's going to pay for it? Mm -hmm. So what do other people in other fields do? So what I'm trying to say is that by speaking to people, we've been able to build up a group of people around us who see where we want to go and are ready to help us think through the issue again and speak about other things. So while in, that's another reason why I'm in Oxford, because we've been able to, when I was doing the MBA and after that, we've been able to build up this group of people who are really, we would not be where we are without them right now. Strive, advice on dealing with governments of all kinds for Atherton as he takes his product to the market. Mm. I think the first thing was don't take them to court. Yeah. <laughs> well, Are you sure? Sometimes. Sometimes. <laughs> sometimes. Don't sometimes. Um, look, we, we have businesses and people on the ground in 29 African countries. And we have people on the ground in your country, New Zealand. <laughs> you know, uh, so we're not afraid to go, and you shouldn't be as African companies, to go anywhere in the world. We've invested, we have, we have a, a business in Latin American, two Latin American countries. Uh, so the, you know, th there's no uh, panacea as to how you you, 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 you develop in a, in a particular country. They're just principles mm -hmm. that you, you need to keep in the back of your mind. Um, so, And the principles are? Well, look, Africa is not exotic. Mm -hmm. The challenges of setting up a business in Africa are no different to any other part of the world, to be honest with you. Um, would I choose Russia over Nigeria? Hey, I'm off to Nigeria. I know it better. Okay, 
So, so the, the principles are going to be pretty much the same. Uh, you have to learn to work with governments. Uh, that's a given. Uh, you have to, uh, if you're going to draw capital, you have to know that you can't take shortcuts with corruption and other things because investors won't support you. Uh, but coming back to just specifically your, your business, the, the way, I mean, we employ about 10,000 people, okay? And we employ a lot of smart people. And, and we work on, we, we talk in our businesses around three issues. We say, we've got to get the product right. What, what's, what's the product here? That's always what first and f we talk of our three Ps. What, what's the product? Okay. Who's the customer to this product? How are we going to monetize this product? The world is full of great ideas. But you've got to get the product right. But you know, the thing with the product is, it's, it's like the old generals say, that um, they, they tell you that uh, a battle plan is only as good as your first contact with the enemy. We say a business plan is only as good as your first contact with a customer. OK, you, 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 you might have great ideas, OK? Uh, but I, until you get to the person who's going to buy this product, pay you for this product, because there's also a lot of products that people like that they're not willing to pay for, by the way, OK? And, and people have developed business models even to cope with that. Uh, WhatsApp functions as a business in which the consumer of the product doesn't pay for it but someone else does. Uh, Facebook does it. Now you've discovered it was global surveillance. <laughs> so you, someone else is paying in the background. So you've got to get the product right. Then it's about people. Your people that are going to build this product, take it into the marketplace. How do you organize the people? How do you draw the talent? at all the different aspects of this business, OK? Down to the mundane lawyers and accountants and regular, we've got people who spend their entire life talking about jurisdictions. Because for example, what we, I have companies in Jersey. Why? Because some guys in our company turn around and say, jurisdiction. So we, we have to register this company in, in Holland, we have to register this company in Germany, this one in South Africa. There is no African place to register except Mauritius. <laughs> My guys turn around and say, Mauritius. Have you been to Mauritius? No, sadly. Well, if you go to Mauritius, there's a whole place there called Cyber City. You walk through the Cyber City, and every major company mm. is there. HSBC, Barclays, they're all there. Why? Because they use Mauritius as the jurisdiction into Africa because the Mauritians figured out a place, a niche for themselves, which is double taxation. They've got these agreements which enable us as companies to avoid double taxation. Okay, and we're not gonna pay twice the tax when my competitor isn't paying it. You know, it doesn't work that way. So, so we get into the people, your ability to draw talent, sustain the organization from ta with talent. But taking the business into market is about process. Efficient business processes are the ones that decide how big you're going to be. How, how do you get your distribution in place? How do you get your, your supply chain? Okay, The decision to manufacture in Africa or to manufacture in Nigeria is made not as, as an ideological thing. Because um, <laughs> if you do that, you're in trouble. OK, I'd love to manufacture Porsche in Nigeria, a great market. But I may not be able at this point in time to get a business model that gets a Porsche produced in Nigeria. So There's going to be issues around supply chain, processes. So we capture that all as process, a disciplined business processes, that's what your MBA should give you. Sounds like it did, actually.
Good job. Anyway, <laughs> um, let's move to Jessica Price, uh, co-founding partner of the Rhodes Incubator. Um, Jessica, what, what's your, your busy incubating startups for the continent and beyond? Um, what makes you optimistic and what makes you, and what feels like the biggest challenge for entrepreneurship shifting to the continent? Sure. Um, so just to give a little bit of background, um, which might help contextualize the question, the Rhodes Incubator, as you say, is, is a startup for startups. Um, but we really target people who don't necessarily think of themselves as traditional entrepreneurs. Um, we like to say we welcome anyone who tries to have an impact. And the method of that impact is irrelevant to us, really. If you have a problem that you are invested in solving, then we are the people to help you think about how to solve that problem. Um, and we found so far that it's the people who are impact driven and who think about problem solving who turn into the best entrepreneurs. Um, not necessarily the people who care most about profit and not necessarily the people who have the best business training who come into our program. And so in terms of what makes me optimistic, it is the group of scholars who've come through our program in the first year who really are incredibly dedicated and passionate about solving problems. And there are no shortage of problems on the African continent. So I think it's having the opportunity to reframe how we talk about entrepreneurship, how we talk about skill sets, and who we think is the perfect entrepreneur, the space for that conversation is, is starting. And that means that people are entering and self-selecting to, to join those kinds of programs who are really smart, who are really dedicated, but also who could choose to put their efforts elsewhere and who are now choosing entrepreneurship as a valuable mindset and skill set to take their ideas forward. So that's, that's the great news. Um, the biggest challenges, I think, are really about what sorts of support systems are in place and how valuable monetary, you know, you have to make a living and mm. people have good options as alternatives. So what are the kinds of funding models, support structures, legislation, which is making becoming an entrepreneur as a career an attractive option in Africa? And I would say that there are models elsewhere in the world which um, make entrepreneurship much more attractive. And the stereotype of the African continent, though that is changing, but nonetheless, the stereotype is that it's difficult and that it's poorly funded. Um, and that, that, even if that is not entirely true, that stereotype in and of itself is enough to be a barrier to entry for people to choose where to be. Uh, so I think there are some real challenges in deciding who comes to the party, who starts to take leadership in talking about issues around support and funding. Are those people continuing to be the big like venture capitalists from the US and the UK? Or are we having more people like Strive who are starting to come to these kinds of conversations and say, we will support our own. And African entrepreneurs can be successful enough to fund other new startups. Is it the case that we are seeing people who are successful, who are basing their companies in Africa, and who are successful on the level that they can compete with someone who's based their company in Silicon Valley? And then are we starting to see new funding models which, which are appreciating impact and not profit? And that's the third thing which I think is really difficult because a lot of what we do at Rhodes Incubator says you can use any business model you want. We care about what your ultimate impact is on a problem. And so it might well be that, for example, a charitable model funded by grants is appropriate for a certain type of intervention. But the money available for grant funding is just not nearly in the, to the scale of money available for seed funding of an angel or you know, uh, first round funding. Mm -hmm. And you need to start changing the way that people value their investments to say that they're going to value investments which promote impact, not necessarily which drive their returns. Thank you. I think we've heard a very clear message from all three people on this panel that the most important ingredient of entrepreneurship is your intent. It's that you want to solve a problem. You are passionate to solve that problem. I think that's what, that's what we're hearing. I, I would like to hear, I'm going to come to you for questions. I'm also going to ask the two academic leads of the Pathways for Prosperity Commission, Benno Ndulu, the former 
Central Bank Governor of Tanzania and Stefan Dukon, Professor of Public Policy here at the Blavatnik School. I'd like you to bring in your um, question or um, reflection into this debate. Um, but I, I do want to bring us back to something that Strive said in his remarks, which is, you know, we're sitting in a school of government, and the example that you took us straight to was Israel. We had the CEO of Startup Nation here two weeks ago, um, Eugene Kandel. Eugene, Eugene, Absolutely. Yeah, a friend of mine. Absolutely. I hope you came in to listen to because Eugene, what? because if you didn't listen to Eugene, then you're not going to understand anything well, I say. I just repeat <laughs> Eugene. Okay, not, not, not true. They each have fascinating things to say, but, but the reason why we were in, we, we've got a partnership um, with Eugene and his um, center is because what the Israeli government have done is very, very effectively use levers of government in education, in funding, in the regulatory environment across their defense sector to support startup entrepreneurship. And so what I'd, what I'd really, but that's only one model of how a government could do it, but I would love a reflection from the room or from you about what this means that government can, can and should positively do. Let's not rehearse all the problems of governance that beset countries all over the world. None are unique to the African continent. But let's think about what are some of the positive things that governments need to be doing to create the fertile conditions for the kind of entrepreneurship that Jessica Atherton and Strive um, are all engaged in. So do you want to comment on that now? Let me, let me say something interesting for you. you know, Around about 1990, I know it makes me look old, uh, but 1990, I went to Silicon Valley. It wasn't called Silicon Valley in those days. It was just California. And I was invited by the city authority. Don't ask the background, but I was keen to know what they were doing. There was no Google, there was no Facebook. But what they were doing at city government and state government level is what produced them. They may not today see it. I remember just being in awe at the, what the civil servants, what the monetary authorities were doing to create an, an ecosystem that produced what you are now seeing. I went to China in 2008 on a similar journey. Again, I, the, as soon as I started talking to their senior policymakers, we found ourselves discussing the Silicon Valley story, which means they were on to it. They were already on to it. And they were telling me, you know about Silicon Valley and these policies, this is what we are doing. This is what we are doing. Look at it today, Alibaba, Tencent, explosive companies coming out of China. Okay? Israel, I was there with my wife who's here with me this, e this evening. Uh, we've, we, I've been to Israel twice this year just to discuss startup nation. There's nothing you cannot learn so, so my lesson for you as policy makers, those of you who will go and serve us as our policy makers, is that you too are wealth creators by the policies you choose to pursue. And it begins with learning best practice, listening to your own people about what are their challenges. We cannot constantly repeat, we can't get funding. You, you to get 10 African entrepreneurs in a room, we cannot get funding. But we sit with the central bank governors, okay, and there's a disconnect except for this one. He's one of my favorite all-time central bank governors, by the way. Bina and I, we, we, I know he's, he did an incredible job, but he knows what I'm saying, okay? I sat once with Nigerian uh, bankers, and then Governor Sanusi, we sat in a room. 
Say, so you guys, listen. Agriculture, 45% of your GDP. Lending to agriculture, 1%. Your banks lend 1% to agriculture. If, if American farmers borrowed money at the rate that African farmers, they would be hunger and famine in Arkansas, let me assure you. It's amazing what our African farmers actually do, given the cost of agricultural financing. So, so you know, these, these are not rocket science stuff. Okay, we've got to learn best practice from others. Mm -hmm. Study those, look at the solutions, listen to our own people's problems. I don't think there's more we can say about it. Uh, Stefan Dirkon. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so, yeah. Um, well, you know, the, the program uh, we're running, the Commission on Technology Inclusive Development, uses the tagline on Pathways for Prosperity. And, you know, it's great to see that, you know, elements of these new pathways, these potential new pathways to prosperity are represented in the room, which is a lot to do with young people, a lot to do with entrepreneurship, and then bringing technologies to bear and see how we can do this. I want to pick up, actually, on something that Strive is saying, and actually see whether we could get more examples. And it's in the following sense, you know, clearly the way our analysis is going is that the ways in which technologies, digital technologies combined with other technologies can actually get, create new opportunities and new exciting opportunities for, for, for development across Africa. We can see what happens say, in Silicon Valley in China. You already said some of the things that should be done. Are there already examples, and maybe it's actually all of the panel, you know, have you seen in Africa something that on the public policy front, that was now really a good thing? Do we have a good example? Because the more we can have a good example from Africa, the more powerful we can actually communicate to other uh, places. And if you feel like giving your worst case, how public policy has done the worst possible, I would be very interested to hear as well. But, but are we, do we have, an, and, and it's not just you, Strive, also the others on the panel, I would really be interested in anything that for you springs to mind, the best and the worst. And can I come down to uh, Governor Ben Ondulu? Governor, what, perhaps yeah. you've got some examples. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think this is very exciting, and thank you, Strive, for sharing this with uh, our future, which is the, the youth. Um, we had an event in Nairobi on FinTech, mm. and from that event, two important uh, lessons did come out. One is uh, a regulatory re regime that allows innovation to lead. Observe, test, and then only regulate mm. tends to be more positively uh, supporting uh, innovation. And here we came to see very clearly that uh, success in mobile money uh, business uh, has been much stronger in East Africa, partly because except the Zimbabwe. regulators, yeah, except, yeah. Except Zimbabwe. Yeah, uh, partly because the regulators there decided actually to uh, take a position of let innovation lead so it's test, learn, and then regulate. Um, second lesson, which is clear, is uh, peer learning and peer pressure. Yeah. You know, for those regulators that are not part of a network that can learn about what is success and cannot be encouraged to take risk, mm have tended also more or less not to be able to break out of their cocoon. Uh, and networks like Alliance for Financial Inclusion, for example, 
have tended to be a, a platform where a regulator that's not pro-innovation feels challenged and they subsequently do uh, make a, a change. I know a Nigerian uh, colleague uh, rarely attended that yep. and maybe that's why it was not rubbing off as, as quickly. Uh, uh, when you made the comment, I know exactly what you also meant. Uh, but uh, finally, from that FinTech event, we did learn one thing, though. It's possible to create a system where you actually can allow, if you can, sorry, create that system where you can allow uh, new products to be tested in a more risk-controlled environment, like an incubation for, for risk itself, and be able then uh, actually to get the comfort. You don't have to have all the expertise in, for example, the central bank. You can create, uh, really, um, if you want, um, uh, an opportunity for the same uh, young startups uh, to uh, set up a system to observe what are the consequences of what uh, is being developed. And they can then together pronounce whether or not this is uh, uh, with reasonable risk to go ahead or not and provide that ad advice. Uh, I'm say, uh, I decided to talk about the last one for, for one reason. Uh, regulatory institutions typically do not have the competencies or the knowledge that the bright and young startup sort of uh, uh, community uh, may have. And we tend to be much more risk averse, partly because of ignorance. So you have to create a system where that knowledge can actually uh, work for you without necessarily owning all of it. So I think uh, we are learning lessons uh, from the work that we are doing, uh, and this will be shared uh, with the rest of the world. Fantastic. And, and for any of you who are feeling that perhaps you're from a community that's not yet innovative, I would remind you that when I arrived in Oxford 30 years ago, modern history, I was told, finished in 1200. And the only kind of coffee you could buy was instant coffee that was probably made in 1200. And if you look at, but seriously, if you look at the way the startup and entrepreneurship has suddenly exploded in Oxford over the last decade through a combination of networks mm -hmm. and knowledge and ideas and access to finance in London. I keep encountering former students who are now venture capitalists and private equity heads here in Oxford talent scouting. You can see that you can do it pretty quickly yeah. in an environment. And you don't necessarily have to have a 900-year-old university. But um, it's, um, it's those other ingredients that can make a difference. Can I'm going to take, yes. Can I just Absolutely. comment on something Governor said about m mobile money? I, I interjected that, except Zimbabwe. Because by the end of this year, EcoCash in Zimbabwe will surpass Mpesa Kenya in revenue. Yes. It has a higher growth rate. More Zimbabweans use mobile money than in Kenya now. Okay, it's a bigger economy, uh, and, but I'll just give you again to show you what the governor is saying. We, we didn't start it, we saw what was happening in Kenya as a mobile operator. And we have an operation in a country called Burundi, just near Kenya. When I saw, when this guy came and gave us his report, so you have to have entrepreneurial managers too, that's the core. We don't come up with all the ideas. But he came with his report. And I was so amazed by, his, by what he was seeing. I said, why don't you go and set up the mobile money division? So we gave him the authority to go and set up this business. And um, 
when he showed to me what needed to be done, we looked at Zimbabwe and we said, I called the governor of the central bank. Now you think I don't get on with the government. It's not true. I call them. I call, talk to them all the time. You'd be surprised who I spoke to. I called him and I said, listen, we can transform the country with this. Millions of people will come into financial inclusion. But we're going to have to work together. Because the bankers, the traditional bankers, they are absolutely going to go berserk. So he says, okay, so what do you suggest I do? I said, well, why don't you take a group of your people and go to Kenya, go to Pakistan, go to the Philippines, anywhere else, and you yourself as governor, you must decide whether or not you think it's a good idea because you're the one who's going to have to fight this. And that's what we failed to do in Nigeria, because the banks won. The banks killed it. Yeah. They said, if, we, if it's going to be done, it's going to be us. So today, Nigeria is the least developed mobile money market in Africa. And in, in this one of the things you have to face as an entrepreneur. How do you position yourself with most of the things you're going to do are going to be disruptive, then they're going to challenge established industries. You cannot do anything without doing that. That's a given. Uber got shut down <laughs> by the cab drivers in London, OK? Because it requires a st So even that is a strategy you have to develop as part of your on entry point. Don't assume that everybody sees what you're going to do and say, hey, this is a good idea. The other guy says, hey, this is going to kill my business. And I'm not going to have this. So you sh you've got to strategize that as part of your entrepreneurial training. And that's true in the public service as well for the innovators. <laughs> yeah. Question at the back. Um, um, my name is Bono Rogers, and um, I sometimes write about African issues. Um, th th two things there. First of all, um, one of the things that I've written about is that one of the biggest blocks in Africa is what I call infrastructure, soft infrastructure, which you've talked about. I mean, there's a lot of talk about infrastructure and think about railways and things like that. But basically, what we're talking about is soft infrastructure. Um, so two questions. One is, what do you think are the biggest drawbacks to people like yourself? And secondly, how can we be able to mobilize the kind of thought process that we've seen here that we can be able to use to sort of push governments, push entrepreneurs to sort of quicken the pace of the kind of developments that you people are doing. Brilliant, thank you. And then down here. Thank you very much. My name is Johnny. I'm from South Africa. I'm only three years now, so now 30 years at Chief Professor Wood. Yeah. Uh -huh. And uh, indeed, uh, absolute pleasure to meet you, Strive. Uh, I'm glad to know that my country didn't provide you with trauma but a safe access and pathway to, to, good, to better things, you know. Um, my question is really about uh, uh, and a, comment, a comment and a question. The comment I want to make, and then it's also a question, is that um, I think that for us to start to see government as the only pathway to enable entrepreneurship is a dangerous space, I think. Uh, I think government with business and volunteers is a pathway. So I think we've got to debunk the notion that government is the way and the best way forward. Government can play its role better in partnership with others. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I serve, on the, I serve on, the, on the board of the IDC in South Africa as an independent, and that's a small board that gives grants and funding for entrepreneurs. I've been doing that for a while, and, 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 and the, the big exam question that, that I, like, always confronts me is what is the best way that we can use our money in a way that really delivers value to the public, you know, mm -hmm. and that can see entrepreneurs smile all the time. And so my question to the panel is basically that, uh, uh, how do we start to create uh, communities of practice, you know, where government, business, volunteers, and even staff as a volunteer, you know, can input into those processes so that we can allow 
entrepreneurs to come together and talk. You see, once you present experts out there and you say they've got the answers, it's already a block. We must create ways in which entrepreneurs can share their knowledge and trauma with each other. You know, this kind of notion of a one-stop shop, and I like the point that was raised that in South Africa, we do have an interesting best practice called the one-stop shop, where you can go to one place, one building, four floors, meet, a, meet 50 entrepreneurs, and all the questions, all the answers to questions you have, you'll find there. It's called the business place. Maybe you've heard about it. But for me, the question really is to say, how do we create that kind of pathway for those partners to come to together to create that practice, which is a lab of innovation and newness thing? Wonderful. So I'm going to come to each panelist and give them a chance. Okay, just one last quick question from the back. Thank you. Thank you so much for your talk. I was wondering, um, you had mentioned how African... Uh, African schools need to catch up with developing countries like China or their systems, basically. So I was wondering that with the um, budget constraints of government, of African governments, how do you suggest we do that? And are businesses like yours willing to assist the government, or what kind of assistance do we need? And then, oh, sorry, my name is Nalianga Emasiko. I'm doing an MPP here at, Blavacne, at the Blavacne School of Government. And then um, on that question as well, I was wondering, uh, Zimbabwe has one of the best education systems in Africa. What makes them better than others? So what's Thank wrong? You. Rwanda's secret. No, sorry, what was your second question? Zimbabwe. Is that Zimbabwe? Yes. Zimbabwe's education system. I thought it was Rwanda. Um, great. So big emphasis on networks, networks that include on entrepreneurs, but also other sectors. Um, Strive's big message about listening across those networks, Atherton's big message about how important those networks are, and Jessica's positively building that, that network. Mm. Can I ask you, as, we, as we, we're just out of time, and I'd, what I'd really like is just to get a reflection from each of you about what's the, what's the takeaway you would want this audience to really go home and think about tonight, given that this is an audience of people who are really keen to see technology and entrepreneurship thriving across the continent. So a reflection from each of you. Do you want to start, Atherton? Yeah, definitely. Yep. Uh, thank you so much. Before I answer your question, I have to answer the question on, no, we are not Theranos. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That is important. It's unfortunate what happened with Theranos. Um, but as a reflection on what the work it is that we're doing in this conversation, I think that we need to start to realize and talk about how the future is definitely different from the present. Uh, I got that concept from a book I was reading called Zero to One. The future is different, and we have a role that we can play in shaping it. And let's play that role and shape it and build a future that we want to be in. And that's the exciting part, right? We get to change things. Now, one of the questions that I was asked was around what kind of gov what, what can government do and what kind of governments have played a role. An exciting example comes to mind, and it's Mauritius. They have reduced the number of steps that it takes for you to register a business. Things like a minimum capital requirement for me to register a business in Mauritius is, is not there. So that helps in terms of helping entrepreneurs work. Then when it also comes to what, what else can, say, government do, and an example of that is property rights particularly inheritance rights. And those are important because we are seeing that they limit the availability of capital or the ability of a female entrepreneur to get in and play and become an entrepreneur because she does not have the rights to the property she stays on. She has not inherited her parents' property. How can we create an environment where we can increase the participation of, of, of women as entrepreneurs? It also goes to the networking piece that you spoke about. Where does networking take place? It takes place in a bar. Maybe it's a club member's bar. What is the social uh, consideration or the pressure that a woman faces if she wants to get into a bar to network? What do we as the family do when we, what are we doing when we're expecting her that when she comes from home, she has to, from work, she has to say, do work in, in the house? Are we giving her an opportunity? Are we making it avail accessible for her to become an entrepreneur? So yes, I think network is important. Now. When we start to talk about these things, and I get really excited. Um, I'm talking too much, right? <laughs> but <laughs> I think that um, the last part I want to talk about is what the government can help around doing is, yes, there is an ecosystem of players. I think the government can help around uh, investment. 
can it help attract investment by creating a stable country? Can it help by increasing the rule of law in the country? So that if I start my business and I have a patent, I'm sure that I have adequate defensibility. I will build other issues to defend my business, to be able to do that. Um, but in conclusion, I think that we've got a brilliant future that's in front of us. I'm really excited about it. And I think we can move. Thank you, Atherton. Thank you very much. Jessica. Um, so I, I was really um, a bit nervous about this conversation, I have to say, because I think that there is one version of talking about tech in Africa which is really focused on the tech and which is in some ways the easy part of the conversation. Um, whereas the success of tech is entirely dependent on the human factors and that's the really difficult part of the conversation. And I'm really glad that most of this conversation in fact has focused on what are, the, some, what are the real human challenges, the political challenges, the cultural challenges, the ways in which our current societies function, um, which act as barriers to the value of that tech being realized. So in that sense, I'm really reassured by the direction and the kind of nuance that this conversation took. Having said that, I think there are important ways that the culture could change in Africa, which builds on the partnerships that you're suggesting. So for example, and, and that's both, it requires um, compromise from both sides. So it requires a change in society's expectation of what government is responsible for. And to that extent, we need to stop blaming government or expecting government to fulfill every need and taking responsibility for providing for some of those needs ourselves. But then it also goes back to Strive's comments around the arrogance of government. Governance. Government needs to give up the rights to control everything and be willing to partner with people who might be able to do some of those services well. And that might not be as private sector. They could bring them into government. We can have entrepreneurship as well as entrepreneurship. Mm. But the ideas of saying that neither party might be best at doing everything, but that both parties could benefit by compromising on who sh takes responsibility for a certain sector of the economy, that those are the kinds of cultural shifts that you need um, to really realize the potential avail available on the continent, but also then to create access to tech, because the tech will follow. The tech is beneficial. The tech promotes efficiency. It improves outcomes. It really allows you to leapfrog a whole series of steps which otherwise are barriers to your development. But if you can provide the kinds of contexts which are suitable to the rest of the human factors coming together, then that's the, that's the scenario where we hope to move towards. And I think that having entrepreneurs who are, kind of, who are both, who are given some global context, so who can step away from the local and like look at things and learn from other contexts, and who are dedicated to going back and solving those problems, that, that's the makings for a real fantastic improvement for the, for the Wakanda of the future. Thank you, Jessica. Strive, last word to you. Wow, it's such wisdom from such young people. Extraordinary. Thank you, Jessica Matheson. You know, uh, I won't answer your questions. I'll leave it to my Facebook fans to answer you. Um, but you, you know, you you raise the issue on on infrastructure, uh, and you also ask the question: What should what should governments be doing? Let me tell you something on, in answer to your, I'll start where you, you left off. One of the things governments need to appreciate is the private sector has more money. Did you know that? <laughs> the, we do. <laughs> the amount of trade in the, on the US stock exchange on one day is more than the GDP of Nigeria. The, the, the money that circulates in the private world is more than the government budgets. Okay, what we need to be able to do is to develop policies that enable effective movement of capital uh, as investment into our nations. And we, we've got to accept that that we don't see it happening means we haven't yet got it right. Because that's the proof of the pudding. Okay, the amount of investment that Nigeria needs to meet its, its population and the aspirations of its people 
what you're seeing right now is insignificant. The same goes for South Africa or Egypt or any African country that we are seeing. There is a lot of capital to help venture capital in Africa, which is not there. We don't need to have venture capital coming from Silicon Valley to Nairobi. We've got pension funds. We've got uh, insurance companies and other sources of capital that we could mobilize with the right policies. We have stock exchanges that, cannot, that are not designed to bring in new investors, new, new listings from young people like you. Did you know that I had to go to court in 1998, 20 years ago, to force the Zimbabwe Stock Exchange to accept Econet Zimbabwe? I took the exchange to court. It was on the eve of, of us making the appearance that the, that the leaders of the stock exchange backed off my claim that their requirement for me to have three years of audited accounts was a figment of their imagination. We listed, and within six months, we have been the biggest company. Investors came, gave us the capital, we built the business. Okay, But we have stock exchanges in Tanzania and so many places. They're just not there to raise capital for entrepreneurs. But these are tools that we need to develop. The Johannesburg Stock Exchange. I'm naming them and shouting them out now. Your rules do not allow for capital formation to support your entrepreneurs. For the guys, the guy who asked me earlier on about what are the barriers? For the guys in this room, zero. There are no barriers. It's not about smart guys like you. There are no barriers in Africa that will stop you being a success with the kind of education and skills that you have. So it's not about you guys that I concern myself about. I concern myself with the barriers for the woman in the marketplace, for the African woman farmer. She doesn't own her land. She has no access to any capital. And yet she feeds Africa. Those are the people with barriers. You guys, you will be billionaires, and I hope I can borrow some money from you. God bless you. Strive, thank you for that. Um, this has been a rich discussion. Um, we've really, um, Strive set the tone right at the beginning that entrepreneurship is about mindset. All the panelists are saying it's not actually about profit. It's about mindset and having a problem-solving mindset something we need in both the public and the private sector. That it's about people and being surrounded by people who push you and challenge you and, push and, and, and support you as well. And it's about a context. It's about a context where risk can be reduced, where regulation doesn't strangle you before you start, where the environment ensures that you've got financial support for entrepreneurship. And as I've, ever, as I've said throughout, many of these things are as true for fostering entrepreneurship in the private sector as they are for fostering entrepreneurship in the public sector. And in effect, we need both. And I think that's, that's for me, a big takeaway from today's panel. But can I close by asking you to join me, first in thanking the Gates Foundation, who are making this commission possible, and for thanking Rafat al Khali and the fantastic team of researchers who are taking forward some of the groundwork of this commission, led by Stefan Dercon and Benno Ndulu. And thanking Jessica Price and Atherton for their wonderful contributions to the debate. But finally, Strive, thanking you, you know, first for, obviously, for, as a commissioner, taking a real lead in this project, um, but also, for leading by example, and example not just in the entrepreneurship space, but in your willingness to support and nurture talent across the continent, starting with small children right through to some of the Master of Public Policy students that you supported in the first years of the school who are out there working for the Minister of Health in Zimbabwe, working for the Minister of Education in Kenya and beyond. 
that kind of support and inspiring behavior is truly what's going to make the continent the place to be over the next few decades. So can you join me in thanking Strive Maziyua, Atherton Mutambwara, and Jessica Bryce.